thanks for organizing the event. Um, <coughs> today, um, the title of my talk is Recent Developments in Self-Supervised Learning for Computer Vision. <coughs> this is actually one of the research directions that we have at Yerevan N. Um, so I'll try to cover the motivation, why it's an important problem, and then try to kind of show the history of how it got developed, and then at the end, to show the recent papers that work in this area. <coughs> so let's try to motivate the problem, and let's do it by saying that the data is expensive, and if you want to label a large data set, it can be very expensive, either it will take a lot of time or a lot of money. <coughs> so for example, the famous ImageNet data set contains around 14 million images, and then if you ask one person to label the data set, and let's say um, labeling each image takes one minute, so this will take around 22 years. <coughs> and then other labeling tasks, such as segmentation or pixel level annotations, they can take more time and then even hours. So if you want to have a large data set, it will take um, forever to um, create a data set, and then if you do so, it might be very expensive. <coughs> uh, but actually, um <coughs> so the traditional supervised learning methods, they, uh, they assume that you have a data set and each data point has its label. So now um, there's a paradigm saying that um, the images contain enough information that um, we can take meaningful representations from them. So basically, without labels, if you look at the image, it contains a lot of information, and then we can try to use this information and then find um, a good feature representation, um, and then try to use this later. <coughs> so this paradigm is known as self-supervised learning. And then it's actually a subcategory of unsupervised learning, but since recently it got um, very popular and big, it got its own name called self-supervised learning. So first, let's, let's talk about how to use it. Um, so let's say we have a large data set without labels. And then let's say somehow we can learn some representations from, um, we can learn how to learn representations from images. And then we can use these representations for other tasks. So we'll talk about it a bit later. Um, and then the downstream tasks for computer vision include classification, detection, segmentation, tracking, and there are many more. And then, so in this figure, let's, let's see um, what, what the idea of self-supervised learning is. So let's say we have a large data set. We want to learn some model, some network, that if we feed it an image, it will give us a representation of it. And later, we want to use this representation um, and have a small amount of labeled data set and train some small model and then um, use it for um, classification, segmentation, object detection, or any other downstream tasks that computer vision um, includes. So the goal is to, to learn this network from unsupervised data, and then use this network for a smaller data set, which is labeled already, to learn, um, uh, to learn it for the downstream tasks. So now the question is how to learn these representations. Um, we don't have any labels, so we have to come up with a plan to learn these representations. <coughs> so to do so, we first have to define a task uh, which doesn't use any labeled data, but uh, we can use the data set itself. We call this a pretext task. So we come up with a task that doesn't need any supervision, but we can use this task to learn some representation. Um, and then it's called pretext because we don't really care about this task. We just want to use it to learn representations. So let's consider a couple of examples. So um, the first one is called context prediction. So let's say we have an image, and then we take two random patches from it. Um, if you ask a human to say, what's the relative position of these two patches, we can easily do so, right? Uh, so let's try to teach this problem um, to a network, too, right? So let's we, we train a neural network which takes input to image patches, and then it returns um, a number which basically tells us the relative position. So if it returns one, it means that the relative position is here, and then so forth. If we have two, it should be on top, three on top right, 
Um, so basically it's an eight-way classification task and we don't really care about this task, but we can use this to learn representations. <coughs> um, another one could be um, solving jigsaw puzzles. So we can do the same thing, but a bit more, um, will be a, a, a bit more complex problem. So let's say now we take nine patches from an image. They can be, they should be almost adjacent to each other. And then we can ask the network to uh, we, we can randomly permute it and then ask the network to reconstruct um, the image of this, uh, actually not the image, but this piece of the image that, that's cut into nine patches. <coughs> uh, again, th th this is a harder problem because in the previous one there was an eight-way classification problem, but here it can, uh, if we have nine patches, it can be up to nine factorial possible permutations. So we can fix n, which is much smaller than nine factorial, and only allow some fixed amount of uh, permutations. So in this case, the network would take an input these nine patches, and then it would return us the um, one of the n possible permutations. Again, this is not a task that we care about. All we care about is learning meaningf meaningful representations that we can later use. <coughs> um, a more recent one, actually. Uh, predicts rotations. So let's say we take images and we arbitrarily rotate them either 90 degrees, 180 degrees, or 270 degrees. And then we give this image to the network and we ask the network to predict the rotation angle. So here we have a four-way classification problem. And then the intuition is that if um, the network understands the content of the image, it should be able to understand whether it's rotated or not or get the angle of rotation. And then, so here we'll get a network, and then it's a classification tar task. So actually for any of this problem, um, all of them are, um, so the first one was 2015, the second one 2016, this one 2018. Um, so most of them used um, CNNs to learn, um, to learn the pretext task, but uh, more recent ones, they can, they can use transformers or your favorite backbone. Again, so this, we don't really care about finding the rotation, but we want to use this task to learn some representation. <coughs> um, but now there is an issue with all this because the downstream tasks that we have in computer vision, which are image classification, segmentation, uh, they have nothing to do with these tasks. And then the networks that we train to learn to solve these tasks um, at some point, they only care about this task. So basically, we would want to have um, another way of finding features or representations of images that are not focused on some specific task, but can actually learn what's inside the image. <coughs> um, so first, let's try to answer the question, what we would want, um, what we would call a meaningful representation. So let's say uh, if I show you a picture or two pictures of an object that you've never seen, you can easily determine whether both pictures contain the same object or not, right? You don't really have to know the object to understand whether two pictures contain the same object or not. Or if one of them is under different lighting conditions or has a different color, we can still figure out that it's the same object. We don't really need much information. So this is what we would expect from, from these features, from these representations. We want them to be ro robust to some image augmentations, to rotations, to um, some distortions, some noise. Um. So why not? Let's try to train the network to be um, robust to these augmentations. So first, let's define the augmentations. So let's say we have the original image on top left, <coughs> and then um, from one of the papers I, I took, I took this set of augmentations. We can crop images, we can resize them, we can crop and resize together, we can drop the color, we can um, add different filters, we can add Gaussian blur, Gaussian noise, we can cut uh, a piece out of the picture, we can rotate the picture, and visually if you look at these pictures, we can easily guess that it's the same picture and they all contain a dog. 
So ideally, we want to learn representations that uh, if you give the network any of these um, 10 images, uh, it will find similar representations. So how to do so? Um, <coughs> the naive approach would be, let's, let's say we have a network, in this case called an encoder. Um, so we give different augmentations to this encoder, it's the same network. And then we add a loss function, making sure that um, the representations learned um, or the outputted representations are close to each other. Okay, so this would be the naive approach. However, this is not going to work because uh, it will collapse. The trivial solution um, would give us a perfect loss, right? It will always be zero. So if you always find the same exact um, representation for all the images, um, then you would get a zero loss. So your network doesn't have to learn any representation. It can just learn that can just output the same exact um, representation for all the images. And then um, all the recent modern research is focused on avoiding this issue. So trying to uh, change one side of this um, network or um, um, somehow changing the data set, changing the, the way we input the data set, um, just making sure that we avoid this um, trivial solution. Uh, by the way, this, this is called a Siamese network. Uh, we'll see it a few, few more times during this talk. <coughs> okay, so the first approach is called SimCLR. Uh, so basically, on the right you can see its um, um, architecture. So it, it takes an image, let's say X is the image, and then it creates two different augmentations of this image, let's say X, Xi and Xj. And then F is the network here that is going to give us the representations. So you apply F on both sides to Xi and Xj, and then you get this Aji and Hj. So these are two representations. And then you have a smaller network G. You apply G on both of them. You get Zi and Zj. And then you try to make sure that Zi and Zj um, agree. Okay, so this is very similar to what we had in previous slide, but why is this better? Because, um, so here we, we can actually define a loss function um, in a way that helps us avoid the, the collapse that we mentioned. So basically for each batch during the training, let's say for each image we create two augmentations and then um, two augmentations of the same image, we keep them as positive pair and then all the other pairs are negative. And if you look at this uh, term, the loss function here that's written, so in the numerator, it takes the, expect the uh, exponent of the similarity between zi and zj. So i and j come from the same augmentation. And in the numerator, so let's say we had n images in a batch, so it sums over um, all the negative pairs. So here's zi and zk, they're, they're diff augmentations of different images. So the idea is um, we want the numerator to be large and the denominator to be small, which means that the similarity between the same augmentations, we want to be large, and then similarity between different augmentations, similarity between augmentations of different images, we want to be small, okay? Um, and then on the right, you can see the pseudocode of um, SimCLR algorithm. <coughs> so basically, um, it takes a mini batch, let's say xk, k from 1 to n, and then for each image, it creates two augmentations, and then it passes through the network, so it passes through the augmentation t, and then f, which gives us the representation, and then g, which gives us a projection, so for both images. And then um, it defines, it, it adds this loss function for all possible i and j's. <coughs> and it aims to, to minimize it. So this is one approach to, um, to avoid the collapse. And then th this was a very successful alg algorithm. Uh, it was published in ICML, ICML 2020. <coughs> uh, 
so they did further analysis to, to see which augmentations are the most important ones. And then, so if, if you see, here we have crop, cutout, color, and then a couple of um, <coughs> uh, a couple of other augmentations. And then, so they basically kept, so here we needed two augmentations to, um, for this experiment they kept one direction just to have the plane image and other direction either have two augmentations or one augmentation, okay? Um, and then they learned the representations and on these representations later they um, um, did a classification task. So the higher the number, the better. So basically from, from this figure we see that um, crop and color have the most effect on the algorithm. <coughs> um, so basically they, they, they try to analyze which, which augmentations are, are the most meaningful ones for, for later analysis. And then as we can see crop, cutout and um, color are, are, are the most important ones. <coughs> okay, but so the later research actually um, changed the direction a little bit. And then, so as if, if you remember we, so here in each batch we had to create positive pairs and negative pairs. Um, but it looks like we, we don't really need the negative pairs. We don't need the negative samples. Um, so the next three algorithms that we'll discuss, they, they come up with a different way. They pretty much create um, a symmetric Siamese network and avoid this, this, this collapse issue. <coughs> so the first one is called Biol, bootstrap your own latent. Um, we have the architecture on, on the slide. <coughs> so we take an image, uh, we apply two augmentations. Let's say we obtain V and V prime. And then, so F is the, rep the network that we want to learn. The, the F is the one that's going to give us the representations. So we apply, uh, let, let's say the, the top and bottom, they have the same exact architecture, but they're going to have different parameters. So let's say the top one theta and the bottom one C. <coughs> so we apply um, F and then we obtain um, the representations and then we apply the projection. So this is exactly similar to wha what we had. And then um, on top, let's say we also have a, a another small network that gives us prediction. So here, um, this is very similar to what we had, but the difference would be um, that in the bottom, we have this stop gradient, which basically means that when we train this network, the gradients don't pass through the bottom part, okay? So we don't really train the bottom part and we update the parameters by looking at the top part. Um, <coughs> so this is called slow moving average. So we learn the parameters from the top part and then with some constant we add to, the, to what we've already had in the bottom part. So this is a way to create um, a symmetric network and avoid the collapse. theta. Okay, it's, it's a prediction vector. So you, you obtain this z theta. Um, let me show you here. So you obtain the um, z, z theta from the bottom and the z xc from the top and z xc from the bottom. And then you have an extra layer here that gives you a prediction vector q. Mm -hmm. And then you try to make sure that these two are close to each other. Okay, so here the innovation I is that uh, we add this top gradient here uh, and we don't train the bottom part and basically the, the network in the bottom, which is called target, so it tries to mimic the behavior of the network on top. <coughs> uh, and then the loss function is um, similar to the previous one, it's the, um, just the mean squared error. Okay, and we have the pseudocode, and then here we have the formula for the exponential moving average. So basically we, we, we update the axis um, by its previous value, and then we add some constant times um, what we learned from the top network. <coughs> and then we have a similar pseudocode. We're not going to um, read it again. 
let's let's move forward. Um, so another network is called SteamCM. So they actually analyzed what the previous method Biol did, um, and they tried to see which parts are are, are the important ones. <coughs> Again, if you see, um, they have an image. They create two augmentations. They both pass through the encoder, and then from the left one we have a predictor. Um, so as you can see, they uh, suggested that the we don't really need the exponential moving average to update the um, the right part, the the target network, but we can just copy what we learn on the um, on the on the left side, and they showed that it's uh, the exponential moving average proposed by Biol, uh, it doesn't really contribute much. <coughs> so it's the same exact algorithm, but they remove that exponential moving average, and they showed that it's um, the behavior is similar. Here or here? Yes. So the previous C. No, no, no. So the this theta is what we learn. Theta is what we learn from the uh, from the top, right? So the gradient passes through the top, so we can learn theta at each step. After each epoch, we can learn theta. That's and then tau. tau is fixed. This is a hyperparameter that you fix. Um, it's a number between 0 and 1. So you fix a number between 0 and 1, and then yeah. this would be your. It's obvious, but uh, maybe we can uh, consider tau uh, which uh, reach uh, minimal region for this. Uh, yeah, so they analyze it in the paper. They show um, the results for different taus. Okay, so they they have tau, let's say 0 0.9, 0 0.95, 0 0.99, and they try to pick the best one. <coughs> um, okay, so the the SimCM actually they um, they try to claim that this exponential moving average um, it doesn't really contribute much. Um, <coughs> um, and the not another network, um, one of the most recent ones is called Dino. Um, it came from meta, meta Research a couple of years ago, um, and it's one of the most popular ones. So it's built on Biol. Um, they still use the exponential moving average, um, but instead they, they simplify the network. <coughs> so they first they make sure that both architectures on left and right are the same. So the left one is called a student network, the right one is called a teacher network. Um, they have the same exact architecture, but they have different parameters. Um, and then, what their innovation is, they suggest that uh, instead of using the mean squared error, they use cross entropy loss. And they show that it, it behaves better. <coughs> okay, so again, you take, you have an image X, you create two augmentations of it. One of them goes through the student network, the other one passes through the teacher network. Um, then you apply a softmax operator, you obtain two distributions, P1 and P2. Um, and then you try to minimize the cross entropy loss which is written up there, the P1 log, P2 log P1. But, uh, but uh, this loss is uh, symmetric if we change uh, order. Okay, that, that's actually P1. a very good, very good point. So w when we look at the pseudocode, code, we'll see that once it gives, P, um, so it gives like both variations. Um, so it gives X1 to the student, X2 to the teacher, and then the other one as well. <coughs> um, Okay, and then they still use the exponential moving average. Uh, we can uh, use also classical definition of entropy minus P1 log uh, P1, uh, P1 minus log P2 log P2. In this case, uh, what is the situation? I don't know, we have to try. Um, yeah, this, this experiment probably costed them a lot of money. Yeah, they, it's, uh, they run it on many GPUs for a couple of days, so it's... Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's something, something we can try. <coughs> um, okay, and then le le let's see actually the, so, so, so far we talked about um, self-supervised learning, but actually let's see, for example, in Dino what, um, what this network learns. So we have these uh, figures, let's say we have these images, and then um, on this ImageNet data set we train Dino. 
okay, without any labels. <coughs> and then, so it, it, the backbone is a transformer network, so we can have, um, we can look at the self-attention maps of the CLS token of transformer. And we see that without any labels, it's being able to distinguish um, figures in, 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 in images. So this basically means that without any labels, it's able to understand uh, what the objects are um, and how objects are um, related to each other. Um, okay, um, and then, and actually if, if you look at the first one, so for example, half of the um, bird is covered, but it can still recover the full bird. So it, it has an idea of what, what the objects are. Um, and then this, this is a good um, intuition that this, this type of uh, self-supervised learning methods can be used for future um, segmentation tasks. Um, okay, and then another, a totally another different um, direction of work for self-supervised learning is called masked image modeling. Um, so here the idea is, let's say we have an image. If we erase part of the image um, and try to recover it, so if you're successful, then we can say that we learn some representations, okay? So we take an image, we split it into um, patches of the same size, and then we throw away some of the patches. So if we can come up with a network that can successfully um, reconstruct the original image, then we can say that it learned some representations. Uh, so the most popular algorithm is called MAE, Mass Autoencoders. Um, it also came out of uh, Meta Research Lab last year. <coughs> um, so the idea is the following. We take the image, um, we cut it into patches, and then we mask, mask out some of the patches. So we erase um, the content. And then whatever is left, we have this large encoder. Whatever is left, we pass through this encoder um, and then we have a light decoder, a small decoder that tries to reconstruct the image. Um, so usually, according to their experiments, uh, the model works the best if 75% of the image is thrown away. So if the 75% is masked, the, the model works the best. <coughs> um, and here we have a couple of examples um, of the performance when we mask 75% out, 85% out, and 95% out. Um, let's take a few seconds to look at them. Um, so the most interesting one is um, on the right bottom. So the original image um, is this one. And then if we mask 95% of it out, this is what remains. And then when we try to recover it, this is what it recovers. So if you look at it, um, this vegetable in the middle um, is not part of any mask here. So the uh, model kind of hallucina hallucinated, right? It thought um, it will have tomatoes there. So this pretty much means that it, it understands what the images are, what the objects are. It understood that there are tomatoes here and then it doesn't have any information what's in between, and it thought it should be tomatoes. While if you have 85% mask, so you have a couple of patches from these, uh, what is this? Um, from the green vegetable in the middle, um, it's being able to recover it, okay? So this, this kind of um, gives us a, an intuition that it, it learned what the objects are. <coughs> um, Okay, and then, so how to, how, how to use this for downstream tasks? So we get rid of the, um, we get rid of the decoder. So we get rid of this part. And then if let's say we have an image, we want to learn its representations. So we cut it into patches and we don't have to mask anything out. And then we pass it through the encoder and it gives us a vector of representations. And we can use this vector for downstream tasks. Okay, so there are a couple of more recent approaches um, that came out this year, iBot and Dino version 2. So they try to combine these two um, approaches, the 
um, the first one that we discussed, um, and then this mass image modeling. But, but they do it in the level of representations. Um, actually, I didn't include them in my talk, but um, if you're interested, um, these are state-of-the-art um, <coughs> uh, methods for self-supervised learning. Um, and yeah, I guess this was the talk. Um, so here I included a link. I don't know if you can click on it. Um, so if you click on this link, it will take us to um, a web page called Papers with Code, where we can see the comparison between um, all these methods. Um, but yeah, I'll leave it in the presentation. If you're interested, um, you can click on it later. Thanks, first of all. Just wanted to ask, you talked about many methods, but what about their needing uh, data? Like, do, do they need a lot equally or Okay, not? That, that's it's actually a great question. Um, except this Dino version 2, all the other methods are trained on ImageNet. And then this Dino version 2, um, I actually mentioned it here, um, it's, tr it's trained on a larger data set which contained 142 million images. But all the rest are, are, are trained on, um, on ImageNet data set without labels. So they use the same exact data set um, to train the networks. And then um, you can pick your favorite um, backbone. Let's say it can be CNN or uh, transformer of different sizes. And differ based on that, you can decide if you need a larger data set or not. So if you take a larger transformer with many parameters, you can, um, you can use a larger data set. Um, if you have a smaller transformer, uh, you can use a smaller one. But yeah, they're, they're trained on, most of them are trained on ImageNet. <coughs> and I think all of them are available online. So you can download the weights and then directly find the representations. And the representations that they learn would be um, what, how to say, like they would be similar or very deep? I mean, since they perform differently, I'm assuming their representations are different, but mm -hmm. if you have a very specific task, mm -hmm. domain is very specific, would you then, how would you choose among these? Yeah, so that, that's actually another great question. That's, that's what we worked at Yerevan N. We tried to compare them for some specific tasks. Um, and then, so there are two ways to evaluate them. One, you, uh, you compute the representations and then try to do nearest neighbor. So basically you have your image, you try to take, find the closest image. So you can also use this for retrieval. Let's say you have 10,000 images and then you find the representations for all of them. Now you take a new picture, you wanna see um, what's the most similar one to this. So you compute this representation and then do nearest neighbor. Um, so ideally, the closest one should be should have a similar similar figure inside. Uh, but it also depends <coughs> depends on the task. As far as understood, uh, today it was covered uh, self supervised learning via only image data, no multimodal data. Um, what do you mean by multimodal? I mean uh, that if we have pairs, of, for example, of uh, images and captions. Okay, so yeah, mm -hmm. that, that, that's what I wanted to hear. So this is called uh, weekly supervised learning. So let's say there's an algorithm called CLIP, um, which is trained on a data set where you have images and then um, captions. Um, but that's, um, so some people call it self-supervised, but it's, called, it's also called weekly supervised. Um, so it's slightly different beca because you have um, you have more information there. Although you don't need labels, it's you're given images and captions, and they can be wrong or so, but it, it's not the same exact um, setup. Were there comparisons of weekly supervised methods and just pure so self-supervised methods? Uh, my guess is that weekly supervised methods somewhat more efficient in uh, 
metrics on downstream uh, tasks? It really no? depends on the downstream task. Um, so for example, we um, recently we're looking at the, um, let's, say let's say you have a robot and you give it instructions. Okay, so, so here you have image and text. So in this kind of scenarios, the weekly supervised ones are more efficient because they have seen a data set like that. So I think it really depends on a downstream task. If the downstream task is such that text data could, could have been useful, in that case, I think weekly supervised would have advantage. And th there are many, uh, so clip is mostly among these algorithms. Uh, so they kind of came out together and they're compared a lot. So it's, um, you, you can easily find some comparisons between them. <coughs> also, they are trained on different data sets. Clip is trained on um, Coco, I think. I might be wrong. And these ones are trained on ImageNet, sorry. Maybe it depends on the size of data set. If we have a large data set of pairs, uh, caption plus image, uh, it will overwhelm no matter how large the data set of just pure images. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Okay, thank you.